Doctor, how are you? Good, how are you? Um, I'm great. Um, I just want to know, when can I start filling out the discharge paperwork? I'm just so excited to share the news with all of our family and friends. Um, they've been supportive for us for the past two weeks, and I just can't wait to tell them. Absolutely. Mr. Stevens, you can start filling out the paperwork as soon as possible right now. <laughs> so it's good. definitely good news to share with yes. your friends and loved ones. Your wife responded very well to the treatment. Thank God, yes. Thank God, yes. And, um, of course, you will have to bring her back in two weeks. Okay. However, should you have any questions or concerns in the meantime, feel free to give me a call. I appreciate it. Thank no you problem. so much. My pleasure. Thank you. I call, oh, paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. Okay. Okay. Okay, all done. Can't wait, we'll get out of here. So phone. Get my wife and I'm out of here. All right. All right. Well, good morning to er good morning. Okay, on. Can you all hear me? No. Hello. Okay. Hello. One second, let me take two different ones. <coughs> Hello, test, one, two, test, test, test. There we go, test. No, test, test. In the back, can you hear me? No, no, test. All the, I'll just take a regular mic, please. But if you can get it fixed, let me know. Huh? All right, that's okay. We don't need that wireless headset. We'll go old school fashion with a, just a wireless handheld microphone. <laughs> All right, well, welcome, everybody, to The Well. We're so happy that you came here. The first well in 2015. hope everyone had a great New Year's and Christmas and all that kinds of stuff. But I hope you're ready to get back into the flow of what we're talking about here at church. And in case you haven't been here for a few weeks, it is the new year. We're still in the same series that we were doing at the last few weeks of December. But the series is taking a turn today because it is a new year, new calendar year. And with a new year comes new hope and new, hopefully, hopefully a new start for so many different things. Let's get caught up where we are in the series and then see where we're going over today in the next week, the last two weeks of this series. We're answering a simple question that we've been talking about for the past several weeks is, what do you do when there's nothing you can do? Which is a question that every single one of us has asked at some point or time or another. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? What do you do when your marriage is, you know what, it is what it is, I tried to change it, it's not going to change, I'm not going to pull the plug on it because I don't want to do it, but I'm just going to be miserable the rest of my life, what do you do when there's nothing you can do? What do you do when uh, your career, you know, you had dreams and aspirations of where you would end up and all these different uh, things that you wanted to accomplish, but you know what, through a set of circumstances, whether it was your fault or not your fault, it is what it is, there's no way out and there's no way forward and you're just basically stuck, what do you do when there's nothing that you can do? What do you do when what you least desired or never expected would happen has now become your new reality for life? And like I said, it just seems to be it is what it is. What do you do in that situation? For many of us, as we've agreed over the past several weeks, this is not only a challenge when it comes to whatever situation we're dealing with, but this affects our spiritual life. This becomes a challenge of faith. Because it becomes difficult for us to comprehend how a God who says he loves me and can solve my problem like that, how that God could leave me here. In my own mind, I say he leave me here in this problem. And how come he doesn't solve it? So it becomes not just a challenge of career or relationship, but it becomes a test of my faith. And it leads me to those conclusions that we talked about in the first couple of weeks that I'll never be happy again. All right, nothing good can ever come out of this. And then we unfortunately reach the point of despair to say there's no point in trying. Why, e why obey God? Why continue to go to church? Why pray? Why believe? Why do any of these things? There's no hope. But there's a problem that happens when we believe those things. And this one thing, we can't escape it. That as much as I want to look at my circumstances and say, this is the worst thing ever, and nothing good can come of this, and I'm just going to be miserable the rest of my life. There's a problem. 
is that there's other people's lives that judge us. Other people whose circumstances are even worse than ours, yet somehow they maintain hope. Other people whose problems are bigger than ours, and when we compare our problems to them, they say their problem, and we're kind of embarrassed to say our problem after that because their problems are much bigger and much grander than ours. And somehow they're not only able to, to survive, but able to thrive. And somehow it actually makes them stronger in their faith. Whether we're talking about John the Baptist like we talked about, or St. Paul, or whether we're talking about people that we know, our grandmas and grandpas, our neighbors, our friends, the person sitting right next to us right now, there are people whose life disproves what we believe to be true. We believe that there cannot be a good God who loves me and who's in my life and problems in my life. We believe that either you have God or you have adversity, but we can't imagine that you have one with the other one. But there's other people who disprove that. And they show to us, in fact, that there is no conflict between God's love and your adversity. There is no conflict. Remember, parents, we discussed this. There's no conflict from as a parent that I love my child, yet I don't give my child everything that he or she wants, that I don't solve every problem that he or she has, and I don't cooperate with their will and everything. There's no conflict for that as me as a parent. I'm okay with that. And in fact, in fact, we will discover when all is said and done, I'll bet you that the times when we felt God was working the least and the least involved, we're actually going to discover he was the most involved and he was actually working the, the, the strongest. And we saw that when we talked about how we have an option and this option is not an easy option, but we have an option that when the adversity comes to embrace that, that adversity as a gift from the hand of God. And no one can force you to do it. And no one can make you or, or, or guilt you into it. But you have the option that to say, this adversity, which I can't shake, this waiting room period of my life, which I hate, and I can't shake it, I embrace it. I try to fight it. I can no longer fight it. I embrace it as a gift from the hand of God. And when we do that, we saw like St. Paul, we open the door to God's grace in our life working in miraculous ways. We open the door like St. Paul, where he said that I have found the secret the mystery of being content in any situation. Why? Because when he embraced his adversity, God's grace was unleashed upon him in a magnificent way. And like I said, it's not just Paul. It's people all around us. It's, it's men and women of God from the beginning of time. From the beginning of time. Just recently I was reading about the early church in Jerusalem. Okay, and how the church when it started. How the church started with basically the apostles and a few of the disciples and a few of those guys. And in the midst of, of, of a horrible circumstance where you had the Romans who hated Christianity. And then you had the Jews who hated Christianity. Then you had a small little group of people right here who said, we're going to be Christian. And in the midst of that immense pressure on both sides, a religion that by all, by all means should have been squashed and crushed from the very beginning. Somehow it thrived. How did it thrive? Because these people understood that adversity is part of a life of Christianity, is not against faith in God. In summary, what we talked about the first few weeks is that when we're in these waiting room periods, we are inclined to believe that God is absent, God is apathetic, and God is angry. We discovered that none of those things are true. That it's not that God doesn't care. It's not that God isn't around. It's not that God is upset at me or I messed up. What it is is that God is with us. And just like we saw God with us, meaning Emmanuel, just like on Christmas night, in the darkest night when everyone was asleep and nobody knew what was going on, God was at his most active when it was dark and no one knew what was happening. That's all recap of where we got to. Now today, now we turn the page. And now today we're going to start to focus on what comes next out of my waiting room. We've been focusing all this time on, like I said, identifying a new category that exists of adversity plus God. That before, we didn't, we didn't think the two could coexist, but we realized that actually adversity and God, those two exist together in the same category. Well, now that I realize that they exist together, and once I embrace this category, a new existence, a new way of living, that adversity is not against God, what do I expect to come out of that category? What can I expect in 2015, it's perfect for us as we start the new year, that as I embrace this situation, what can I expect to happen? I thought in the beginning 
that if I have faith, then the problem will get solved. But now I've come to the conclusion that there's a good chance that it doesn't get solved. It may or may not get solved, but what will come out of it? What can I expect God to do? What is it that I'm waiting for to come out of this waiting room? And to answer that question, we're going to look at a passage written by one of my favorite authors in all of the Bible. We're going to look at a man named James. And this man named James wrote a very, very, very small letter, okay, which is called the book of James or the letter of James or epistle of James. Very, very, very small letter, only five chapters. You could read it in 10, 15 minutes, okay? It's like probably three pages. But this letter contains some of the most powerful, powerful teaching on what to do in those waiting room periods of life, or even better said, what God is going to do through those waiting room periods of life. Before I get into what he said, let's do a little background, because I believe that when you understand who is writing the text, then it becomes more powerful, just like we saw with St. Paul, when we saw that the background, what he was going through when he wrote that I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Let's look at the background, who is this James character? If you look in the New Testament, the name James appears many times. There's several Jameses, okay, it's a popular name. There's four Jameses that appear in the pages of the New Testament. The first, there's two of them who are, are the 12, part of the 12 uh, apostles, okay? James, the son of Alphaeus, and James, the son of Zebedee, okay? He was also the brother of John. So there's two Jameses who are part of the 12 apostles. I'm not talking about that James. That's not the one who wrote it. There's another James who's a father of one of the 12 apostles, okay? There was two Jameses in the 12, and there was also two Judases. There's Judas the bad guy and Judas the son of James, so that's the third James. We're not talking about that James. The James that wrote the epistle wasn't even a believer during the time of Christ, during his life on this earth. Okay, he didn't come to faith until, at least we don't hear about it, until after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's strange because James occupied a specific position that no one else of the 12 did. He had a particular relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. He was part of Jesus's family. All right, Jesus, James, as you see here, maybe you can't see it really clear. He's oftentimes called the brother of the Lord. All right, and that's how he introduced the brother of the Lord. Now, when it says the brother of the Lord, it doesn't really mean his brother, like a brother and sister. All right, anyone who, you know, has read the, the scriptures know that the term brother means relation, but it doesn't mean necessarily brother and sister. All right, because we know that Jesus had no brothers and sisters, that his mother, Mary, was a, a virgin, not just before Jesus' birth, but after Jesus' birth, she was ever virgin. And some people say, but the scriptures say that James was the brother of the Lord. Forgive me, okay? I know most, most Christians today would believe that, that it, this, he is his brother. It's a very small-minded, and forgive me for what I'm going to say, ignorant way of looking at it. Because anyone who actually digs in and just goes past the surface sees that in the scripture, it's very clear that there's so many times they call people brothers who aren't really their brother. Because the terminology that was used back then, brother meant like cousin, or some say meant like a stepbrother, whatever it may be. It's that we have to understand the context of the way that it was given. The idea that Jesus actually had brothers and sisters, meaning that Virgin Mary had other children after Jesus' birth. If you believe that, you're in the small minority of Christianity that did not exist, watch this, for the first 1,800 years of Christianity. Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus buried, Jesus rose, and for 1,800 years, this idea of Jesus having brothers and sisters was never introduced into Christianity. And I say 1,800 years, and some of you say, hey, wait a minute, but I thought, you know, like Martin Luther and the Reformation and the 15, 1600s, yeah, even those guys, Okay, even the Protestant Reformation, even they will tell you that this idea of Jesus having brothers and sisters is a foreign concept. It wasn't until the mid-1800s or maybe the early 1800s that someone said, hey, when it says brother, I think that means really Jesus had a brother. And that's the equivalent of me sitting here today. Everyone who knows me knows I don't have any sisters. I have two brothers, okay? So you say, I say, uh, this is here my sister Sarah. Okay, and I say my sister Sarah, and you all understand, the people who know me know, she's not really my sister, but she's like a close friend of mine. So I'd say, that's my sister Sarah, my sister Sarah. And then someone comes 1,800 years after today, 18, so in the year, do the math. Let's say it's 2015. Let's say in the year 4,000 A.D., someone comes and says, no, what Father Anthony really meant was she was his sister. 
And they say, no, the people who knew him for the past 2,000 years said, no, that wasn't his sister. No, after 2,000 years, I discovered something that all the other people missed. It's a combination of ignorance and stupidity, but you call it whatever it is that you want. Anyway, that's not really our topic, but sometimes I just get going on that kind of stuff. James was either the stepbrother or the cousin of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go with cousin because that's more popular and more commonly believed. He's the cousin of our Lord Jesus Christ somehow. Like I said, he was not a believer during the life of Christ. And this kind of makes sense. This kind of makes sense because what would it take? Think about it. What would it take for me to convince you that your cousin is God? <laughs> like your cousin that's spilling all over himself at the Christmas dinner table. Your cousin... Okay, who can't can't keep his mouth from saying something dumb when he's opening the presents like your cousin, your dumb cousin. What's the likelihood that I can convince you that your cousin is the son of God? So James struggled. And it wasn't until that Jesus rose from the dead that even James was like, yes, even my own cousin, even I can say that's my cousin. Okay, but even I can see that is the son of God himself. After G after James came to belief after the resurrection, became an instant leader. He became the bishop of the church, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem being the most important city in, Christian, in Christianity, even after Christianity started to spread, he was the head there. What was life like in Jerusalem? Again, imagine, what would life be like? You're in Jerusalem, you're the head of the Christians, you got the Romans who are in power, they hate you. You got the Jews who are in religious power, they hate you even more. And you now are James. You have all forces around you working to squash you and James, and all the Christians were persecuted heavily in Jerusalem. And James was eventually martyred in the year 62 AD, 62 AD after being beaten with clubs. Okay, is how he was martyred, but he did not renounce his faith. Now, with that as a background, let's read James chapter 1 from verse 1 through verse 8. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren. Look, he starts, this is the very first, the first page, and he starts right, boom. He gives it to us. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. We'll come back to that. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The key verse that we just read right there that we're going to talk about right here right now is when he says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James gives us the formula for per perfection. And he says, when you fall into trials, and when you're in those waiting room periods of life, you hold on with to patience. Because it's through patience that you will be perfect. Now, this word perfect should ring a bell. For those who were here before, we talked about this word perfect in the last series on God's ethics. We talked about be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And perfection is the goal of, uh, that God has given for us. But perfection, we understand, doesn't mean sinless. Okay, because once you've already committed a sin, you can never be sinless again. What does perfection mean? Perfection means spiritual maturity. And the goal of everything we do in our spiritual life, agree with me here, the goal of everything we do is spiritual maturity or perfection. You agree with that statement? What we want more than anything else is to be perfect, is to be spiritually mature. Not just to be spiritually born, but to be spiritually mature. Too many people think that the spiritual life is I'm born and then I graduate. There ain't anything in life where you graduate on day one, all right? The spiritual life is like anything. You enter, you are born, and then you grow to maturity. Our goal, agree, is spiritual maturity, right? That's what you want. Careful what you ask for because you just might get it. Because what St. James tells us right here is that spiritual maturity comes through patience, through trials. You said you want to be spiritually mature. I asked you who wants to be spiritually. You also said, yes, spiritual maturity. I said, we want, to be, oh, we want to be spiritually perfect. Okay, you want that? And if that's the case, you not only have to be willing to accept trials, you have to learn 
how to maximize trials because that's the path to perfection is patience through trials. Or another word for that, because I didn't want to just say patience because sometimes we have this wrong idea. Patience means like twiddle my thumbs and be bitter and miserable. That's not patience that leads to perfection. The patience that leads to perfection is the perseverance, the tough patience, the faith-filled patience, the he who endures to the end shall be saved patience, the one who holds on and knows and believes and trusts that God will come through and what God has promised he is able to provide because that's who God is. Why this patience through trials is so important for us specifically because we talked about just three days ago, for those who were here for New Year's, I spoke about this during the liturgy as well. Our goal for 2015, we agreed, our goal is becoming who we already are. We said that in Christ, we are rich. We are heirs. We have a rich inheritance. But think about this. Just because you have an inheritance doesn't mean that you necessarily lay hold of it because the, the, the criteria to lay hold of your inheritance is maturity. Think about a child. I say, I have a million dollars for this child, but I don't give it to him at age three because he's not mature enough to handle it. As he matures, then I'm more likely to give it to him. We don't give a child, I say, I'm going to buy my kid a car, but not until he's mature enough to be able to handle it. Well, in Christ, we are the richest people in the whole wide world. But if we're not spiritually mature, we negate all the promises of God. We negate all the promises of God if we do not follow the path to spiritual maturity, because that is the criteria. Yes, we are rich in Christ. Yes, we have many gifts. Yes, we are heirs. But the key, the criteria to those gifts is our spiritual maturity. That's why this issue of patience through trials, which is the path to perfection or the path to maturity, that's why this is important stuff. What does maturity mean? Child. I have an immature child. I have a mature Adult, okay? What's the difference between a child who's immature and an adult who is mature? I say, okay, someone said right or wrong, okay. I would say this. I could tell the difference between mature and immature this. If I say these two people are hungry and I say no food right now, we're fasting, what's the immature going to say? No. <laughs> I want food now. Gimme, gimme, gimme. What's the mature going to say? I want food. I really want food. I'm dying for food. But I'm willing to delay food. I'm willing to understand that now is not the right time for food. Immature, gimme, 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 gimme. Mature, willing to delay gratification. Y'all agree with my definition? Spiritually, which are you? Spiritually, which are you? That's why maturity and age are not linked. Just because you are older doesn't mean you're more mature, right? Okay, parents, okay, you have two older doesn't mean more mature. And it certainly doesn't mean it in a spiritual sense. Because I know people who are spiritually very old. They've been doing this spiritual thing for years. But maturity, they still, uh, they came in at first grade and they're the big kid, the six foot three kid still sitting in first grade. Spiritual maturity is the ability to delay gratification until the appropriate time. Where are you spiritually on maturity level? God says waiting room. What do you say? Gimme, 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 get me out of here. Now, 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 now. Can't take it. Or are you able to say, God, I believe in you. I trust in you. I hate this. But I'm willing to wait until you say is the right time. That's what I'm saying. All the promises of God are based on that ability to be patient through trials. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the verse that said, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And I told you, I showed you a picture of a football team that used that as their slogan. I can do all things through, this, through him who gives me strength. That's not, that's not what the promises of God are for football games or for, or for your grades. It's for St. Paul who says that I have learned in whatever situation, if I am hungry or I am filled, I have learned to be content no matter what the situation. And therefore, to you, I, God says, to you who can learn to be content in any situation, I unlock the mystery that you can do all this through him who gives you strength. See how it works? There's a connection between our inheritance and our patience. Let's go back and break it down kind of verse by verse quickly to understand how, how St. James gives it to us. First, in verse 2, he said, My brethren, 
count it all joy when you fall into various trials. That's the hardest sentence in the whole thing. And it's the very first one. And he says, count it as joy. Now, what does the phrase count it mean literally? Because if we understand it literally, it'll make it a little bit easier. Because I, I look at my, my waiting room and I say, I can't rejoice in this. This doesn't make me happy. Well, I'm not saying make you happy. I'm saying count it as joy. What does the word count mean? Count is an accounting term. All right. It means to classify something as. So I say count this as an expense against that. Means put it in this category. Right, accountants? Count it means give it this label. Even if you don't agree, even if you don't like it, put it in this category. The waiting room happened, and I immediately counted it as the worst thing that ever happened. The end of my life. It'll never, ever be good again. Don't count it that way. Even though that's how you feel, count it as joy. How? I don't know. But just put this label on it as joy. And you sit there and say, no, I can't. My situation is too hard. My situation is the worst. I can't ever do that. I say, hold on. It's only the first verse. Let me get through the rest of the verses and then see if that doesn't change your mind. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So now St. Paul, I'm sorry, St. James, tells us something which gives us a little bit of comfort. Do you find a little bit of comfort in this verse? What St. James is telling us here is that the trials are not just trials, like I said, for your career, your marriage. It's a trial for your faith. There's an expression that, that in my mind, I hope I, I can explain it clearly. It's escaping the moment. Like sometimes when you're in the moment, you can't see. But then you come to me and tell me about your waiting room. And because I'm outside the moment, I can look at it and say, this is bigger than just your marriage. This is bigger than your career. This is bigger than whether you get married this year or next year. Something bigger is happening here. You outside the moment, you escape the moment, and you see this is a test of your faith. And actually, when you're undergoing trials, your faith is on trial. And in fact, I don't want to say it because it sounds irreverent for me to say it, God himself is on trial. He's testing you, and you're kind of testing him. James acknowledges that. And he says, remember, he's speaking, he's in Jerusalem, he's being persecuted, he's about to be killed. Okay, he's martyred for his faith. And he's saying, guys, what's happening here is bigger than us. It's bigger than us. That somehow through this trial and this persecution, that 2,000 years from now, there'll be a funny man standing on a stage in a city called Arlington, which doesn't even exist now. And this man is going to speak to a group of people who are going through difficult times. And he is going to talk about what we did right now and how we respond to this persecution. And that story is going to inspire generations of people. And inside that people who are being inspired is the next whatever is the next missionary to whatever, is the next guy who's going to change the world, is going to be inspired by the words that were based on how we respond to this trial here in the first century. It's bigger. It's bigger than what you see. And that's why he says, Therefore, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, Lacking nothing. He says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Because the faith that leads to perfection. Real faith is not faith that gets what it wants. Not the, I lost my job on Monday, and then I prayed, and then on Wednesday, uh, I won the lottery, and I'm the richest person in the world. Look, I have real faith. That's not faith. Real faith is not when you get what you want. Real faith is when you don't get what you want. Real faith is when you are, like I said, St. Paul, who did everything right, who preached, who prayed, who kept himself pure, who fasted, who did everything right, and he found himself in prison, awaiting execution. That's faith. John the Baptist, same story. Everything right, forerunner for Christ, found himself all by himself, and Jesus is over there doing all kinds of miracles for everyone except me. That's faith. Real faith has to be tested and tried in the fire. Now, here's the question that I want you to, to answer this question. 
Why is it that patience in trials leads to perfection? Why? Patience in trials, patience in trials equals perfection. You know why? Man, if I could say this a hundred times at the top of my lungs, I, I never stop screaming this. Because God has a plan. Because why? Because God has a plan. Say that with me. It's very comforting. It's reassuring. Thinking about your waiting room, why do you have to be patient? Because God has a plan. I'm in my situation. It stinks. But I need to wake up in the morning and say, this stinks. But God has a plan. And that plan, like I said, is bigger than I can see. And if I could scream this a thousand times, I would say, God has a plan. God has a plan. God has a plan. Now, this is where I really struggled here because I could sit here and talk for another hour on this one point. And I could have brought 50 verses. And I struggled more than anything else to get it down because I could have brought you about, I know the plans that I think uh, towards you, says the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 10. I could bring the verse of Isaiah 55 that says, you have these tiny little thoughts, but my thoughts are not like your thoughts. I could bring you all those verses. And I'm trying to sneak them in right now. But the real verse that I want to really show you to summarize this in one place, watch this verse. Hebrews 6, verse 11 and 12. And we desire that each of you should show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, meaning don't give up, but you imitate those, here's the key phrase, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Who through faith and patience, you need both. You believe, that's great. But if you only believe today and don't believe tomorrow, that's not going to do anything. You're patient, but you don't have faith, meaning you don't really believe. You're just waiting it out bitterly, nothing. But when you add faith, that I believe, and you add patience, that I'm willing to wait, man, unstoppable is God in your life. Because no matter what you believe about your waiting room, no matter what you believe, no matter how miserable it may be, it may be out of your control, but it is not out of God's control. Yes, you didn't plan for that baby to come, but God did. And God put that baby in your life, and that's part of his plan. Yeah, you didn't plan for that relationship to end, but God's plan is bigger than your plan, and God's hand is bigger than your hand. You didn't expect that to happen at work. You didn't expect this illness to come. All those things, I agree, that's the worst thing ever. But none of those things are bigger than God. None of those things are bigger than God. And the one who trusts and who waits, unstoppable is God in his life. Yes, God didn't give you what you want. And yes, you don't, you're lacking. But God, unstoppable in your life because there's nothing that's outside of his control. But you will inherit all the promises through faith and through patience. Like a child born to a rich man. A child born to a rich man. Let's say I'm a rich man. Pretend I'm a rich man. And I have a child who's born to me. And I say to that boy, boy, you're the richest kid in the preschool right now. You don't realize it because you're all in diapers. And you're all sucking your thumbs. And you're all eating uh, uh, Cheerios off the floor. But you're the richest kid. And you say, how? How, Dad? Look at me. I'm eating this poor beggarly food. I ain't no better than, than, than that kid over there or that kid who he spits up on himself. I ain't no better than those kids. And I say, boy, faith plus patience, you inherit it all. Not at age one, not at age two. But if you believe, and if you believe, believe, believe that I'm your father and I'm bigger than the dumb little kids in your preschool and I'm bigger than any situation that you can handle, if you believe in me, and you're willing to wait. Our problem is we struggle with the patience part. I think we're okay with the faith, especially at times, but it's that patient part that kills us, isn't it? What usually happens is we are faith, and we are faith, but then we don't get the results because we like things quick. So what we do is we pull the plug. And we hit the eject button on God. And we say, you know what? Yeah, I tried. Let me tell you, you still go to church and you pray? Let me tell you what going to church and praying did for me. Sit down, let me tell you how it did nothing for me. You still believe in God's going to answer your prayer? Okay. But this ain't Sunday school no more. This is the real world. And in the real world, we tell those things to kids in Sunday school about believe when you pray. And we just say that to make them feel good. And we tell them in Santa Claus and all that kind of stuff. But that ain't real. And we hit the eject button. We say, I'm not going to continue 
Like I said, I'm, I, I'm not going to continue to hold my morals. I, I'm going to go at it the world's way. I tried God's way. That God's way didn't work. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to lie. I'm going to go around God's way. What happens? Like, as a priest, I hear a lot of stories. The story is always the same. The story is always the same. The story, every single, like, if I told you 100% of the time, you 100% of the time, the story is the same. The story is, I believed in God. I trusted in God. I went through this tough time. God left me. I left him. And the story never ends with, and my life has been great ever since. It never ends with, I've been happier. I've been healthier. I've made better decisions. Life has been fantastic since I left God. It's always the exact opposite. It's always been that ever since that day, I haven't smiled. Or ever since that day, or ever since that time, I've been cynical. I'm not judging anyone. Like, I'm not judging you. I'm, I'm advising you. Don't quit. Don't quit. I'm not judging you for quitting. You, in college, rough years, your dad, your mom, whatever. I, I'm with you. My heart goes out to you. I'm with you. I'm not judging you at all. But I'm telling you, quitting through faith and through patience. Watch what I'm going to say right now. Watch what I'm going to say. You're going to hate me for this. You, if you don't hate me already, you're going to hate me for this. But this is my first bold prediction for 2015. I'm going bold prediction. See, here at STSA at the well, okay, we don't just give you spiritual. We give you predictions, okay? We're horoscope, all kinds of stuff like that. You don't read that stuff. You listen to me. You ready for a prediction that I bet you is going to come true? The greatest tension in your life right now is exactly where God will work the most in this coming year. You hate me. <laughs> You hate me. But this is what I believe to be true. Said another way, where God is looking at and where God is going to work the most is in the area that you are trying to push as far away as possible. Get that out of my life. Where God says, that's actually where you're going to find me. I always think of, I always think of in the story of the old, in the Old Testament story of when Moses crossed the Red Sea. Y'all know the story. You've heard it many, many, many times. That God tells his people, Israel, as led by Moses, get out of this place called Egypt and let's go party in the, in the promised land. So people say, yes, Lord, this is great. We want to be free. So the people escape. And God does all kinds of miracles to get them away from the bad guys, the Egyptians. And they're out in the middle of nowhere. And they're living a the good life. They're about to hit freedom. But then all of a sudden, the bad guys decide they're not going to let them get away easily. So the bad guys start chasing them. And the bad guys start getting closer and closer. And all of a sudden, the good guys look. And to the left, mountains. To the right, more mountains. Behind them, bad guys. What's in front of them? Red Sea. This is not a good situation to be in. This is not a good situation. So if I'm here and I'm Moses... If I'm here and I'm Moses, I say, God, this sinks. This is against all of your promises. And God says, really? God, if you love me, save me from this. God says, really? If you love me, make the sea go away. No, I make the sea go away. Make the mountains jump and smash those guys. No, I make the mountains smash and jump those guys. God, if you love us, do something to those guys. And God says, Moses, come here. Listen very carefully to me. I'm not going to move that mountain. I'm not going to move that mountain. I'm not going to move those bad guys. I'm actually going to make them come much closer. I'm not going to make them less scary. I'm going to make them more scary. I'm not going to move that sea. That sea is going to be right there. And I'm going to trap you inside of that little box. But Moses, you may be trapped, but am I trapped? I'm God. I don't get trapped by dumb little army guys or by little mountains that I could behind my back. I don't get trapped. You may be trapped, but I am never trapped. And in fact, if you want to see me work most mightily, just wait and see. And Moses, through faith and through patience, what happened to Moses' waiting room? It was transformed into the greatest miracle in the history of all mankind. Like the resurrection of Christ, that's probably number one. Dead guy raising himself, no, nothing tops that. But after that, Man, a sea 
splitting in two, people walking through the middle of it, seeing a wall of water, a wall of water, like a wall of like in the water right there, like a mirror. Where does God work most? In the area of greatest tension in your life. That ain't easy stuff. That ain't easy stuff. But if you trust God and you trust that he has a plan and then you're willing to wait, you're going to experience the same thing. Now, because that's not easy, all right, and God knows that's, that's probably the most difficult thing, James finishes up here, okay, and I'm finish up. And I want to finish up with some advice that James gives us on how to accomplish that. And then I want to give you a real-life example. So advice and an example of, of how, how to do this practically. James says this in James chapter 1, verse 5. It says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. He's talking about being patient through the trials. Then he says, anyone who needs wisdom, ask for wisdom. Why wisdom? What is wisdom? Here's my definition of what wisdom is. Wisdom is the ability to see current circumstances in a greater context. Would you agree with that? The ability to see current circumstances in a greater context. And when you are going through those trials, those difficult periods, which you just can't get out of, we need wisdom to be able to see it in a bigger picture. Again, parents, we understand this. A child comes home from school. Okay, my children are in fourth grade and second grade. And if you know a child in fourth grade, small things, oh, it's the end of the world. Like, you remember when we were in high school, things that were the end of the world? Like, I dropped my books in the middle of the hallway, and everyone laughed. It's the end of the world. The end of the world. I can never show my face. It's the end of the world. And as parents, okay, we have to pretend to care about these things and pretend that these things matter, but they really don't matter, okay? And we know that, like, oh, it doesn't really matter, okay? You struck out. Again, that's okay. You're probably going to strike out next week. That's okay. Like, it's not that big a deal. Wisdom is that exact ability to be able to see things that are in, in front of me in a bigger context. Look at James's theology of trials here and how it differs from us. Our theology is when you're in this tough period, pray for it to be gone. Pray for power to overcome it. James doesn't pray for it to be gone. James prays for the wisdom to benefit from it. Actually, you know, that, that's a true story that someone told me one time about a lady who was in the hospital and who was, her husband had passed away and, and she was sick and she was basically near her end, all right? And she was really suffering health-wise. And a lady came to visit her from church and said, you know, we're praying for you. We're praying for you. We're praying for you. So the lady, the sick lady said, you know, what are you praying for? And the church lady, like, didn't know how to respond. It's just one of those things you say, we're praying for you, okay? We don't even know. So she said, we're praying that God gives you strength. And she said, please don't pray for that. She said, pray that God gives me the wisdom to benefit from this. You know what that is? Draw a picture of that lady. That is spiritual maturity. That is perfection. God loves the prayer. That's why he always promises to answer it. God loves the prayer. He says, God, let me see this as you see it. He loves that prayer. He always answers that prayer. God, open my eyes so that I can see this circumstance, this relationship, this trial, this whatever. Let me see it from your perspective. And God loves that prayer. He will always be faithful in answering that prayer. But when you pray, next verse, verse 6. When you ask, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let him ask in faith. Why? Because, again, back to parents and children. You know that your children can ask you in a way of, I believe in you, Daddy, or I'm questioning you, Daddy. And the, I'm questioning you, Daddy. Why did you do this, Daddy? That question never gets a response. The, I believe in you, Daddy. I trust in you. But explain to me. It's different than explain to me. You see what I'm saying? Because the one who doubts, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. God, I believe that you have a plan, that you, have, you are up to something. I believe that my trial is bigger than my trial. 
I believe this trial of my faith is bigger. And, and maybe, maybe, maybe generations to come will be affected by my response in this trial. That's what we saw with St. Paul when he wrote those letters. That St. Paul was in that waiting room, and he wanted to be bitter, and he wanted to be miserable, but he decided to embrace his, his waiting room. And generations to come are thankful. And we agreed back then that you don't know what lies in, 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 the, in the balance of your waiting room. You don't know. Generations to come may be affected by your decisions that you are making in the waiting room here today. Faith plus patience equals unstoppable. Because I know my God has a plan for me. I know he has a plan. I know that the shepherd knows what he's doing. And he's got a plan. And I know that plan is always perfection. And if I can believe and I can trust and stay out of his way, again, like the inheritance, I know my daddy who promised me that I will be rich. If I can just abide by what he's telling me to do, stay out of his way, don't mess this one up, then I got no doubt of where it is that I'll end up. I want to read to you an email and a tweet. First, the tweet. Someone tweeted out the following thing a few days ago, and I loved it. Okay, And I did something that I very rarely do, which is retweet it out. I very rarely do, but I did this one. He said, the greatest accomplishment of the new year, saying for himself, that the greatest accomplishment he wants to accomplish in the new year is to wish we were no one else but ourselves. The greatest accomplishment that we can do this new year is to wish that we were no one except ourselves. Let me say that in, a, in more than 140 characters, all right? Spiritualize it a little bit. The goal for me, for this new year, for the rest of my life, is to see where I am as the best place to be. And how God has put me in this waiting room and say, this waiting room is not, I'm not spending the year to say, the goal this year is to get out of this waiting room. I'm going to say, this waiting room that I'm in right now is the best place to be. And how I'm going to make it the best place to be. That's my goal. Similarly, I want to read you an email that I got this past week from a friend of mine in Australia. And that friend doesn't know I'm about to read this, but when he checks out, he, wa he watches all the, the messages, he's going to be surprised when he sees this tomorrow. A friend of mine who, I don't never met him, but I met him like through my blog, okay, and we kind of communicated that way, we kind of become, like we kind of communicate back and forth. I'll change his name just for the sake of, for him and his wife. Let's call him John, all right. John has cerebral palsy, all right, but if there's ever been an example of someone who is stuck in a difficult situation, and he's not, uh, and I'll, like, I'll read what he wrote, but he wrote very little about it, but I, I know it's worse. If there ever you want to find inspiration, I find inspiration from this guy is what I'm trying to say. Because you're going to see someone who is in the waiting room with cerebral palsy, and you hear about him and his story here in a little bit, and you see how he's facing. I'm going to read it to you verbatim, and forgive, there's some English things, but, but that's okay. I, I w didn't want to correct it because I wanted it to be authentic. He says, as previously stated, I was born with mild cerebral palsy. It affects mainly my physical movement, a little slurred speech at times, and a few other things I've worked around over the years. I couldn't do anything about it. By the grace of God, I've learned over time to deal with it and to live within the boundaries. I grew up in what you might call a dysfunctional family, troubled parents who themselves were raised in troubled homes. Between 1990 and 1994, at various times, I was homeless. I was disappointed that I didn't have the money or emotions to finish college as w and was hurt and embittered for a time. This is a real person. It's not a story. I had chronic depression for a few years. I can see where, as you referenced in one of your talks in the waiting room, the Lord has recycled a lot of stress and trauma and brought good from it. I want you to see this is real. Okay, this is someone who is not living a believe in God because life is good. This is someone who is struggling at all times with the tension of I trust in God and I believe in God, but there's very difficult things in my life. I now live with a wonderful wife and a daughter in government-subsidized housing. Government-supported housing has a bad reputation here in Australia as in some other parts of the world, but we live in what I call the Taj Mahal of government estates. The police say that this area is the least troubled estate in the area. Since we've lived here, two friends, formerly Buddhists, have since become Christians. We might not have known them if we didn't live in government housing projects 
So by the grace of God, I try to extract good, anything useful, out of what otherwise might be difficult situations. I thank God for the opportunity to teach children Bible lessons each week at a local school. His job, okay, he struggles with work, obviously, because of his, his, his disability. But he teaches kids Bible lessons, like little preschool and kindergarten kids, things like that. And he loves it. I thank God for the opportunity to teach children Bible lessons each week at a school. I've discovered that I'm not just teaching them from a textbook. I thank God that I'm another person who had had his life transformed by this stuff. Yes, so you can see where the Lord has brought me, like others, through many dangers, toils, and snares. But I must confess, there is one grief I have. At times, I feel a bit of despair that I fight with and find it hard to let go of. My wife has had polio from her childhood. And since her late 30s, she's had constant problems with her spine and legs. So he's cerebral palsy. She's polio. Her spine is slowly collapsing, as the doctor says. We have different medicines. I learned how to massage her legs to help her sleep easier but her pain comes back sometimes daily. Mid-December 2013, so one year ago, our doctor said that my wife will end up in a wheelchair by Christmas of 2014. Of course, I forgot about it during the year, just got on with life until a few weeks ago. We went out and did some shopping and borrowed a wheelchair from the shopping center while looking around the shops I remembered what the doctor had said. Friends at the local Salvation Army have offered to give us a wheelchair. While I am grateful, I am also sad that she now needs it all the time. I have long prayed for good health for my wife and for myself, and I despair particularly when she awakes in the night in pain. She has strong faith in the Lord, which she admits has prevented her from suicidal thoughts or other awful things. Watch this. I always commit my day to the Lord, whatever happens, but I just get a nagging feeling, a pain inside when I consider the far greater difficulties my wife lives with every day that I have to deal with. Why hasn't the life, why hasn't the Lord healed, and I'll change her name, why hasn't the Lord healed Judy? Why must she carry this difficult burden every day? We walk by faith and not by sight, true, but these are things on my mind every day. I have rarely spoken about this to anyone, even in church. I just find it difficult for several reasons. It's not, it's easier not to be self-pitiful. It's incredibly difficult not to despair over my wife. And he goes on and thanks me and says a few other nice things. That's a real person. And this is not a person. Like what I, want, I, what I want to say here is don't listen to my preaching. Okay, don't listen to my preaching. Don't listen to me sit here and say believe and trust. Here's an example of someone who's a real person, who's not far from all of our age group, and you saw what he's going through. And there's a person who struggles and adversity and pain and his wife and sickness and no hope. But there's a person who says, I don't know what's going on here, but I trust God has a plan. And no matter what I see with my eyes, I pray for wisdom. And I ask God to give me his wisdom to see things in a greater context. Because if I believe and I'm willing to be patient, man, there's nothing that God can't do through me. I'm going to leave you with this verse. James chapter 1, a few verses later after he gave us this little speech, James says this. He says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. That's my friend here. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord himself has promised to those who love him. What I want to say for 2015 and for the rest as many years as God gives us life, our trial is bigger than our trial. And we need to pray that God gives us the wisdom, the context to see it in that bigger picture. Because what the Lord has promised to those who stand the test, nothing on this earth compares with that. That's what we're aiming for in 2015. Let's stand together and say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, as difficult as it may be for some of us, as hard as it is to say this, Lord, we thank you for our trials. And we thank you for the tough situations because we know that we wouldn't be close to you without it. And we wouldn't have a hope in, in something greater beyond this life without our trials. As much as we hate them, as much as we resist them, as much as we want them to go away, Lord, we trust that you have a bigger plan. And I pray, Lord, that you'd fill every single person in this room 
that you fill us with your faith and fill us with your patience. Give us the wisdom to see things as you see them. And let us to, to keep our faith till the very end, Lord. Let us endure till the very, very end. And let us not be shaken by the trials and the temptations and, and the different things that, that the enemy throws at us to shake us. But let us stand strong. And let us to be patient. And let us to, through faith and through patience, inherit the rich promises that you have for each one of us. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us all where we are most weak. And that you'd stand by us and let you let this year 2015 to be a year, a rich year, not a year with no problems, but a year where we, through faith and patience, inherit your rich, rich promises that you have for us. We ask these things in the name of our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and with the prayers of all your saints. Hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you all very much. Have a great week, and see you all next week. And they are inside your hand. You got a voice that sounds. You want